Well, I'm absolutely delighted to be here, and thank you so much for that, that generous introduction. And as you can tell from my time at the Fed, being there from 2006 to 2009, and chairing the Banking and Supervision uh, Committee, uh, it's all my fault. So now you know who to, to blame, just point the finger at me, it makes it very easy, and then when we get the question and answer session, no defensiveness, we can just have that as, uh, as a basic assumption. Because certainly there were enough people in Washington who were uh, pointing the finger of blame at somebody, they pointed it at the Fed, and I happened to be chairing the Supervision Regulation Committee, so, uh, so, the, point, uh, so the finger often went, uh, went quite, uh, quite, directly, uh, quite directly to me. Well, people often ask me how I'm making the transition from that low-pressure Fed job to the high-pressure tenured academic life. Well, I'm surviving. It's okay. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm making it through. But I want to start off with one, uh, one anecdote uh, to, to describe how it's just a little bit different being uh, a Fed governor as opposed to being, uh, being a professor at, uh, well, anywhere, um, including at uh, a great university like, uh, like University of Chicago. So when I was still a professor, I was asked to, uh, to go to the Atlanta Fed to chair a, a committee, uh, sorry, to chair a, uh, uh, an academic panel that they were having at a conference that was on hedge funds. And, um, and, uh, and so um, I then became uh, governor of the Federal Reserve Board, and I said, sure, I'd still do this. But I'd only been governor for about, uh, about two weeks. So this is my first public appearance as a governor of the Federal Reserve. And so all the wise ser services reporters are there, and they have their little laptops, and uh, they are, um, uh, are eager to, 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 to get a story. So they, of course, wanted to know what I was going to say about monetary policy. Well, I've been at the Fed for, for two weeks, and I wasn't prepared to, uh, to make any uh, statements about monetary policy. I told them the only numbers I was going to say was five minutes left, two minutes left, one minute left. Uh, not going to say anything about uh, where interest rates are going to go. So they run back over to their laptops and type in. Uh, and if you've seen Reuters or Bloomberg or other screens, they have a, just a headline with no story behind it. It comes across in all capital letters. So flashed around, uh, around the world was Federal Reserve Governor Rosner says nothing about monetary policy. Now, of course, if every time someone said nothing about monetary policy, that would, especially as, uh, you know, every time an academic said that, that would take up a lot of space uh, and a lot of time. But it takes up a lot of space to actually put Federal Reserve Governor Crossner says nothing about monetary policy. So if you, the screens will truncate at some point, and so a number of my former students and friends in the market said, Randy, we're really impressed with your maiden voyage, because what flashed across the screen was Federal Reserve Governor Krosner says nothing. And that was reported around the world. And said, you know, that was really, really impressive. You know, a headline that uh, shows the emphasis that's put on every word and every syllable that comes out from, from the Fed. I remember one of the, um, uh, the uh, early meetings that we had, we introduced the word yet into one of our statements. Now, we, that had gotten no discussion. It was just seemed like a word to, uh, to the clarify the garment what the word yet meant and uh, headlines saying you know, with the word yet in quotation mark they mean by this and we really didn't mean anything more than the regular dictionary definition of the word uh, of the word yet and we weren't trying to signal anything with it but there's just so much emphasis on on every uh, every single word if I were still at the Federal Reserve Board I wouldn't be speaking to you from just notes, um, I would have a prepared text, and if I deviated from that text, that would then get, uh, fortunately, I don't have to have a, a prepared text, and so, uh, or, and to the extent that I have any notes, you won't know whether I deviate from them or not, so there's, uh, there's nothing that'll be newsworthy that'll be coming, uh, coming out, of, out of that. Well, it was a truly, truly amazing time to, uh, to be at the, uh, at the Federal Reserve Board. Um, hopefully, no one in my lifetime or anyone's lifetime here uh, will ever have an experience like what I had from 2006 to 2009, um, although I certainly I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, it was an amazing, I had an amazing group of people to work with, the staff at the Federal Reserve Board, uh, as well as throughout the entire system, um, were, are just excellent, excellent people who were incredibly dedicated and worked very, very hard. Uh, unlike in the private sector where you can give bonuses when people work hard, I would always lament and, and tell the staff, I really wish I could give you uh, some that would pay off if above 3%. Uh, but I, I couldn't do anything like that. They are just, uh, you know, we, we don't do things like that in the, in, in the government. But these guys worked incredibly hard and were incredibly good. But also my, my Federal Reserve Board uh, as chairman, and also uh, Rick Mishkin, uh, who was a professor at the, uh, uh, in the economics department for, uh, for a number of years here. Uh, 
three, uh, there should be seven people in the now, Congress hasn't seen a number of uh, appointees. Uh, I guess that's because Congress thinks that there's not much going on at the Fed. This is the gentleman who. Uh, Ah, uh, okay, I'll try to. <laughs> so, when I was at the Federal Reserve Board. <laughs> yeah. All right. I, I can hold that if that's easier. All right. All right, how's this? If I can go like this and go like that. All right, full range of motion. It's like, it's like repairing the economy. If we were only that easy, just, uh, this is like you know, the, the experts, not the Federal Reserve staff, we always had to rely on them because things would go wrong and they were the ones who actually knew, had the technical knowledge to know how to get things, uh, get things going again. Well, I had uh, in, incredible people to, uh, to work with at the, uh, at the Fed. Uh, three of the five of us on the board uh, had actually studied economic history. Uh, ben Bernanke, myself, and, uh, and Rick Mishkin. And that was incredibly valuable to us. And it was also uh, something that we never expected to be so relevant to our, our, our time there. Um, uh, ben had come here for Milton Friedman's uh, 90th birthday. And I was actually working in the White House at the time, and unfortunately was at an, uh, an international meeting and so couldn't, uh, couldn't come back to this. Uh, but he gave a, a speech in honor of, um, of Friedman and Schwartz's great monetary history of the United States, one of the classic contributions by University of Chicago economics, and in particular, Milton, uh, Milton Friedman. And um, Friedman had been very, very critical of the Federal Reserve in the 1930s for doing nothing during the, uh, the crisis, that it had the power to do it, and it just stood by because it had mistaken theories and mistaken ideas. Uh, what was amazing is if you look back to the minutes in the 1930s, as the economy is just collapsing, GDP fell by about a third, the price level fell by about 30%, unemployment rate uh, skyrocketing to over 20%. The Fed was focused on inflation rather than deflation. If you look at the minutes, that they're all worried about uh, if, if we provide any more support for the economy, they weren't providing anything to begin with, that they thought there could be an inflationary, inflationary burst. And so Friedman, really, Friedman and Schwartz really said that the Depression became the Great Depression because the inaction of the, uh, of the Fed. And, and uh, Ben, uh, lightheartedly, but uh, it turned out quite presciently, turned to Milton and said, Milton, we've read your book. We're sorry. We'll never let that happen again. And that's exactly what we were trying to do while I was at, at the Fed. We were not going to make the mistakes of the Fed in the 1930s and sit idly by. And that's not to say that we didn't make other mistakes and that history will, uh, will, you know, will, will be the judge of whether we did the right things or wrong things. But obviously, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Fed from 2006 to 2009 and, and continuing on uh, has not been a place of inactivity, but a place of activity, trying to respond to uh, respond to the uh, uh, the, uh, the challenges of the of the crisis, and and I emphasize to uh, to my students the importance of economic history, not just for this one particular episode, but cri when crises come up and they do come up periodically, and uh, and if you take a look at my uh, my book with with Schiller, you'll see that I'm not saying when that uh, the the reforms are going to prevent crises in the future. I think they are just part of um, uh, part of a dynamic economic uh, economic uh, economy or a dynamic economy, and so you're going to have some volatility. You're going to have some uh, some ups and downs, but uh, the reason for studying history is is because History focuses on, tends to focus on the extreme events. And if you're going to work through a crisis, you can't just use the regular data that you had, that you've accumulated over the last 10 years or 20 years. You've got to look at, the, at what happened in the Great Depression. You've got to look at the Panic of 1907. You've got to look at um, uh, the um, uh, other, uh, other particular crises that occurred, the savings and loan crisis, for example. And that's where you get a lot of learning. Certainly, it's valuable to know uh, the data in, in normal circumstances. But when you're outside of the realm of normal, ner normal circumstances, your models are not necessarily going to be helping you that much because you're just not quite sure whether what you're seeing is something that can just be a linear extrapolation of what you've already seen 
or whether it's something, something very different. And so, um, so I, I think knowing economic history is incredibly important and, uh, and incredibly, uh, incredibly valuable, not just as a good University of Chicago education, but also if you're in the markets or dealing with the markets, knowing the history and knowing what you can and can do in responses, evaluating uh, when policymakers do or don't make those, those responses is, is something that'll be very important for your own survival, no less for, uh, uh, for the, the broader survival of the, uh, of the economy. And, and so I, I think uh, that's something that, um, uh, that, that is, is, is very, very important. In the book, we talk a little bit about history, but the, the book isn't really focused quite as much on, uh, on the historical issues. So it's a lot more on, on trying to, to, to look forward. What else? You know, what happened to the crisis and then what do we need to do to try to, to, try to respond? And so the approach that I take is a very much an, an economist approach and, uh, and an academic's approach uh, is that we try to clarify the objectives. What do we want out of regulation or regulatory reform? Then diagnose the problem, what actually went wrong, and then come up with solutions. Well, our Congress uh, didn't think that was a very sensible approach. So they passed Dodd-Frank, which is the regulatory reform bill, in Dodd-Frank, they created the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission to try to decide what, what happened. So what they did is they decided to have all the solutions before they figured out what went wrong. That doesn't make a lot of sense, I would have to say, uh, but uh, there are many things that uh, the Congress does that doesn't make sense. Um, although, um, as, uh, as, as many people have said, uh, there may be a lot of flaws with, uh, with our system, but um, uh, most of the other systems are an awful lot worse than, uh, than, uh, than ours. Uh, so, um, uh, I may be critical of, uh, of Congress on, on this, but uh, uh, at least there's a Congress and at least there is a deliberative, uh, a deliberative uh, process. But I'm going to take the, um, uh, what I consider a more, uh, uh, more economic point of view, objective, diagnosis, and, uh, and solution. So what's the objective of, uh, of regulation or regulatory reform? And I think this is true more broadly, not just for uh, what we, we do in, uh, in finance and, and banking, but more generally. And, and there's a great University of Chicago tradition on uh, economic analysis of regulation. George Stigler, one of the great Nobel uh, Prize winners from, uh, from Chicago, who fortunately I was able to, to know before uh, he passed away uh, just a, a year and a half after, uh, after I arrived here. Sam Peltzman, uh, a great colleague at, uh, at the Booth, and, uh, and Gary Becker has also been an important contributor there. Uh, as, as well as in, in, in many, uh, many other areas. So the objective is to think about trying to uh, tr promote, uh, 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 promote and support sustainable economic growth. And, uh, and note that I put in, so I emphasize economic growth because I think economic policy should be about economic growth. But I also put in that weasel word, sustainable. So what does that, you know, what do I mean by that? Well, I put that in because there had been a lot of academic studies that showed if you have a deeper, um, more um, well-developed financial sector, that tends to be correlated with um, uh, more economic growth. And then people try to do more sophisticated studies to see, well, is it just a correlation or is it actually causation? I won't get into the econometrics of that, that here, but uh, there was a, pretty much a consensus, I would say, by the, uh, the early to mid-2000s that what um, a, a deeper, more developed financial sector is one that's going to lead to, it's going to cause higher economic growth. So a lot of countries around the world were trying to promote uh, growth of the financial sector. But potentially there's a trade-off. A standard thing in, in uh, finance analysis or in economic analysis is so, the so-called risk-return trade-off. So you can get return, higher growth, but potentially you may have to uh, tolerate some higher risks in order to do that. And I don't think that uh, we as an economic profession had been very careful about looking at that risk return trade-off. We were simply looking at uh, the, the benefits of uh, the higher return, higher return that comes from more, more economic, uh, from more financial, uh, f financial depth, uh, but not the, uh, uh, not the potential, potential trade-offs. And so that's why I put that, uh, that word sustainable in there, because we want to think about volatility, we want to think about uh, sustainability, we don't want to simply maximize economic growth. We want to maximize something like sustainable, uh, sustainable economic growth. So 
that's, uh, that's the broad, uh, broad objective. Well, diagnosis, uh, certainly that uh, we don't have a lot, of, uh, a lot of time here. I could go on for, for many lectures, and my students in my money and banking class know that uh, I, I do of trying to think about what were the, uh, the origins of, of the crisis. Um, I'll talk about a few aspects of that, and then during the question and answer session, we can get into, get into more details. And something that I really learned from my time down in Washington is just the, the fragility of the infrastructure of markets. So I'm a you know, University of Chicago guy, um, you know, very, very market oriented, uh, but it, I hadn't realized that these markets are not just like Apple markets. Uh, that we usually think of that, well, people come together, everybody, somebody will want to buy the Apple, uh, they'll be uh, bidding back and forth, uh, the Apple will be sold, someone will take a bite of the Apple to make sure it was a good Apple, and then, uh, and then move on. Well, financial markets aren't like that. They require an enormous amount of investment in infrastructure. And what do I mean by that? I mean data. So you need to build large databases to understand what are, the, um, uh, what are the risks, what are the correlations, what are the returns associated with a particular contract or a particular, uh, a particular set, of, uh, set of contracts. You then have to build models based on, on that using uh, the, the insights from University of Chicago, actually primarily, although uh, a few other places may have made some contributions too, uh, on trying to think about valuing assets, thinking about um, value at risk, thinking about, uh, about, uh, about risk management. And uh, you also have to have investment not only in the models, but in the people who are going to think about the models, to use the data, to, uh, to think about uh, the, the markets and think about changes in those markets. So you need the so-called human capital in addition to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the regular, uh, regular investment in, these, uh, in, these, uh, uh, in, in the data and the, uh, the models and the, the computers themselves. And also, extremely importantly, you need a legal infrastructure. Now, there's been great work done at University of Chicago on uh, law and economics, one of the you know, leading contributors in the world on, on this. Uh, Ronald Coase had uh, gotten a Nobel Prize for this. I was fortunate enough for a number of years to be editing the, the Journal of Law and Economics and also teach over in the law school for, uh, uh, for a bit. And, uh, and there, there'd been a lot of work done to show that if you don't have very good property rights enforcement, if people don't know whether they're going to be able to reap the return from their investment, if they don't know how contracts will be enforced, or if there's a very inefficient system where maybe you know in the end you will get your money, but you might have to wait 10 years and pay an enormous number of, uh, of fees, that, that's not a very useful contract. People don't invest there. They, they pull back. And, and I sometimes think that um, what happened in the fall of 2008 was a little bit like the U.S. suddenly becoming a bit like Tanzania and having that kind of legal uncertainty. Because we really hadn't explored some of the edges of contracts before. We hadn't really explored what happens when a major firm goes down. A lot of people deal with very highly rated firms because they simply don't want to think about these issues. You say, well, you know, I deal with someone who's AAA because I don't want to have to think about setting up contingency plans for what happens if uh, the person is downgraded, what happens if the person doesn't pay off, what if I have to go into bankruptcy, uh, you know, is, my, uh, is my account separated out and so I, I operate if, even if the firm gets in trouble or is my, my uh, account so-called commingled so that you just become part of the, uh, the bankruptcy queue. These are questions that you, you choose highly rated institutions so you don't have to think about this and no one had really thought carefully about it. But suddenly everyone realized, well, these highly rated institutions can get into trouble and maybe in deep trouble. That week in, uh, uh, in uh, mid-September of 2008, uh, where uh, the entire investment banking industry was transformed either through failure, merger, or getting uh, commercial bank charters, was a truly amazing one. That's one that normally economic history texts would spend uh, uh, chapters and chapters on something like that. Here we had to do something like that in a weekend. And a lot of that was driven by these uncertainties about, uh, about contracts. What would happen if one of these institutions went down? If I have a secured loan, do I actually get to keep that security or does that security go back into the bankruptcy pool? Um, how will also, uncertainty on the government side, how is the government going to, to treat some of these, these contracts? How will they treat some of these markets going in the future? We've been doing a lot of, um, uh, a lot of uh, what many market participants considered quite arbitrary things, uh, and, and some of which I also considered quite, quite arbitrary, but they were outside of the, the Fed's ambit, uh, on, uh, for example, preventing short selling, uh, to, to not allow people to, uh, to sell short because there were concerns about people 
pushing down market prices by shorting, but that's also a natural hedge in markets. And if you can't hedge, you may be uh, unwilling to commit as much to, to a particular market, and so people were pulling back. And so all of these kinds of legal uncertainties made it a very, very difficult time for people to be willing to invest. So they didn't have the data about, uh, about a lot of things with uh, uh, subprime mortgages or some of the details of, of contracts, et cetera. So suddenly they needed to find this stuff out and they needed to build models because they hadn't been carefully modeling things and they needed to hire people to, to do those modeling. But you're in the middle of a crisis. People are gonna say, well, I'm not quite sure this is the time to invest. And so you pull back. Uh, the most, um, probably the, uh, the, the clearest example of, uh, of the pullback was in the, uh, related to the, the money market mutual fund industry. So uh, we had, uh, uh, we've developed a, a, a effectively a shadow banking system, uh, a system of, uh, of institutions that are outside of regular, uh, regular supervision and, and, regular, uh, and regulation uh, uh, that, uh, that banks face, but provide things that are very close substitutes. So many people have money market mutual fund accounts, and most people thought of those as not really as a mutual fund that could go up and down, but that one share equals one dollar, and so they'll always be able to get their, their money out. And they liked them because they paid higher rates of interest, because money market mutual funds weren't subject to all of the, uh, the burdens that are, are, were, put on, uh, were put on the banks. That's not to say that there's anything wrong with the money market mutual funds, that's just a natural state of things that People are always going to, uh, to try to get around any of the regulations that you put out there. And I think that's something that regulators often, often forget, is that um, you can't just get people to do what you want them to do. You can't just write it down in the law and people will follow that. You write it down in the law, and then a lot of what is done is trying to get around what those are. And you have to be cognizant of that, that that's a consequence of your regulation. It's often said to be an unintended consequence. I think it's a very clear consequence. It may be unintended by the, uh, uh, by the regulators, but it's such a clear thing that it's going to happen that you need to, to take something like that into account. But we had this uh, development of the money market mutual fund industry. About $4 trillion uh, of, uh, of uh, money's, uh, funds were in this, this industry. About $6 trillion of deposits in the banking system. Now, normally, the deposits are an important source of financing for all the bank's operations. We developed a deposit insurance system in, uh, in the 1930s to try to, to prevent bank runs from occurring at, uh, uh, at banks, panic runs by, by depositors. And we saw very little of that during the crisis. That kind of safety net seemed to work reasonably effectively at, uh, at preventing runs. But there's another form of runs that could occur. The money market mutual fund industry was effectively uh, funding the banking system, $4 trillion of very short-term financing doing short-term so-called repurchase agreements, so that was secured lending. The banks would have some securities. They needed to finance them. They would lend them overnight uh, out there. Uh, there was also something called commercial paper, which is a short-term uh, short asset, uh, short-term uh, well, short asset if you hold it, short-term liability for the, uh, for the banks that would have you know, relatively short horizons, uh, 30 days, uh, maybe, uh, maybe 90 days. And uh, the money market mutual funds were very important purchasers of these. And, and so it was very important uh, they were crucial. I mean, if you think of the, the total amount of effective deposits as being the $6 trillion in the banks and the $4 trillion in the money market mutual funds, money market mutual funds are 40% of, of the funding of this sort of deposit funding of banks. Well, uh, there was one, one fund after, uh, after, Lehman Brothers, uh, after Lehman Brothers failed, um, the, uh, uh, th there, was, uh, there was one fund that had a lot of concentration of, of ex exposure to, to Lehman Brothers, and they so-called broke the buck. They started giving less than a dollar, just slightly less, like 99.79, uh, um, but that was enough to make people very concerned and make the entire industry concerned, and suddenly there was a $4 trillion run on the banking system like that. And that is, um, uh, because of, uh, because, part of it because the the, uh, uh, the, uh, the regulatory arbitrage, part of it because of uncertainty about the uh, about the contracts, and part of it uh, just sort of lack of, of information about uh, what the uh, uh, you know what the the different risk exposures were at the the various institutions. People just pulled back, and that's uh, as you can imagine from sitting at the the Fed at that time. That was an extremely extremely uh, distressing uh, distressing uh, time, uh, because. The Fed doesn't uh, regulate or supervise the money market mutual funds, uh, but they are key providers of, of funds, and suddenly the entire mutual fund comp, it wasn't just one individual institution, that one institution triggered effectively a run of, of $4, trillion, uh, $4 trillion. 
And so that really underscores this interconnectedness amongst the, the institutions uh, that comes from the, uh, the, the, some of the fragility of the infrastructure, but also comes from just um, the way things have developed over time. It's not just the banking system like in the 1930s. You've got money market mutual funds, you've got insurance companies, you've got hedge funds, you've got a whole bunch of others uh, who are very important in these, uh, in these markets. And um, uh, they are important funders of, of, the, uh, of the banking system and also potentially important sources of, uh, of volatility in the, uh, uh, in the system. And so uh, it's, uh, it's extremely important to think about that when you're thinking about um, the, uh, the solutions because a lot of what we had done in the 1930s uh, in, in responding to the, uh, the Great Depression and the financial problems there were really on a bank-based system. And, and as I said, you know, something like deposit insurance focused on that source of uh, fragility of financing. This new source of, uh, uh, or, or more, more extensive source of uh, uh, short-term external funding, uh, money market mutual funds and many others, that was something that uh, the, the system was not well, uh, well positioned to either monitor or to, um, uh, to regulate. And so, uh, so now uh, getting on to, to thinking about some of, the, uh, some of the solutions, we want to try to get at uh, uh, some of these, these issues of contractual uncertainty, some of the issues of, uh, of uh, interconnectedness, and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and of course, think about uh, the right incentives to get things working properly, rather than just the incentives to get around the, the rules that, uh, that are there. I won't go through all the, uh, the, uh, the, the proposals that, it, uh, that we have in the, uh, in the book. I'll just highlight, uh, highlight a few of them. Uh, one of them has to do with uh, the resolution of, uh, of financial institutions. So one of the things that we really saw, in, uh, and really, uh, really as, as you could tell from my, my remarks here, was that we didn't have a good way to deal with um, the failure of a large financial institution and so, especially one that was a non-bank financial institution. So uh, improving that and trying to improve the certainty so that people would know what they're going to get, they would know what's secured and unsecured, they would know how their contracts are gonna be treated, they would know how their accounts are gonna be treated. That's really the thing that I think is, is a very crucial thing to, uh, uh, to address. Uh, the Europeans have so far done nothing on that, which is extremely important because their banking system is, is really, is very much dispersed over all the different uh, countries of Europe. They have no cross-border resolution mechanism. At least within the United States, we have, uh, have uh, a well-developed uh, traditional, uh, traditional mechanism for, for dealing with things, even if it isn't uh, uh, the best for, for dealing with these issues. So within other areas there, I think they even have more challenges than, uh, than we have, but, uh, uh, but I think we still don't have um, uh, the, the most effective system possible. And Dodd-Frank, the, uh, the regulatory reform bill, does address this issue. And so in principle, we could be improving, but I don't know. And that's actually something that is, uh, is true of almost everything that's in Dodd-Frank. Uh, the Dodd-Frank bill is a, an extensive bill, two or 3,000 pages, depending on what font size you want to, uh, to look at. Uh, and uh, many, many titles in it addressing a whole bunch of different things, but it, it sets in train more than 250 different rulemakings by the, uh, the, the regulators and supervisors, more than 70 different studies, and so sometimes people have asked me now that I'm back in academia, what grade do I give Dodd-Frank, and the only grade that I can say is incomplete. We just don't know whether these will address the, the fundamental problems or not, although I have some concerns that they're not going to do a, a, a good job of that. So the resolution mechanism. So now, uh, Dodd-Frank gives uh, the, uh, the government, in particular the Treasury in consultation with the Fed and other supervisors, the right to force an institution into bankruptcy. We've never had this before. Bankruptcy has always been a private, uh, a private action, either uh, bankruptcy protection by the, uh, uh, by the equity holders of the, of the firm or an action by the creditors of the firm to force a firm into, into bankruptcy. So this then uh, gives the, uh, the government the right to, uh, to, to push firms into bankruptcy. And so in some cases that may, may be valuable to have either the threat to be able to do that, to force an institution to, uh, to merge or, or get, its, uh, get its act together when it's posing a threat to the system, uh, or in principle to be able to do an orderly resolution for a large firm. Unfortunately, the, the language of Dodd-Frank is really all over the map on whether it will help to um, uh, make the, order, the resolution more orderly or more chaotic. So some of the wording in, in Dodd-Frank is about uh, making sure that there'll never be another bailout. 
again. And taxpayer money will never be put at risk, so that means just immediate liquidation. Well, that may not make a lot of sense in the middle of a crisis to force an immediate liquidation. And bankruptcy codes in general don't force immediate liquidations. They typically put something into so-called bankruptcy, uh, bankruptcy protection, and you try to work things out to, to maximize, maximize value for all the parties, uh, 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 parties associated with the institution. And so there are exceptions in this uh, that allow uh, the FDIC that would act as the conservator or the receiver of the, of the institution uh, to, uh, uh, to perhaps provide some, uh, some support to the institution, but it's not clear how they would do that. It also potentially gives them the, the ability to, to change the seniority, to change the priority of how contracts will be, be protected. Now that's one thing that, at least under uh, regular bankruptcy codes, is relatively clear and there's not that much uncertainty. There's some, but not that much uncertainty associated with it. Now, in some sense, making this a political decision of which classes of creditors are going to, uh, to get 80% uh, uh, get versus 70%, that potentially, uh, uh, that potentially introduces a lot more uncertainty. So I think in principle, it's very important to try to deal with this and improve this. I think it's good that Dodd-Frank did do this. The Europeans have done nothing uh, on this. Um, in the international realm, we've made no progress on this, and that's still an important issue. Even if we were to completely solve the issue internally, all of the major financial institutions are international financial institutions. So you've got to think about not only bankruptcy in the US, but uh, in London, in Frankfurt, in Tokyo, in Singapore, et cetera. Uh, and so, um, so I think it's good that we've, we've at least gotten the debate started but I'm not sure that we've actually, uh, actually had something that's going to improve, uh, improve that, uh, that piece of the, the issue. Second thing is uh, um, something that I had uh, written a lot about uh, before I'd gotten down to, uh, gone down to Washington, and it was in praise of uh, the Chicago markets. So we've had these, these great uh, futures markets, and now more broadly called derivatives markets in, uh, in Chicago, uh, where you can trade uh, pork bellies and corn and uh, interest rate futures and uh, uh, silver futures and gold futures. And these markets have been incredibly robust over time to all sorts of shocks, whether it's the First World War, the Second World War, the Great Depression. Um, uh, the failure of, of major institutions. We haven't had problems uh, in these, these institutions, uh, in, in these markets in Chicago, because of the, um, uh, the clearinghouse system. So in the markets in, uh, in Chicago, there's a clearinghouse that effectively acts as a guarantor of the contracts. So this gets back to the, the issues I had before about the uncertainty about contract enforcement. Well, if you're trading back and forth of one of these futures contracts on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, for example, and you may be trading with another party, Merrill Lynch, or oh, uh, 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 God rest its soul, it's no, no longer there. Um, uh, I, of, I often joke that I, I know an awful lot more former, uh, former CEOs than current CEOs, because uh, they went through quite a few of them, and there are also fewer institutions, fewer institutions left. Uh, but if you're trading with uh, J.P. Morgan Chase or, or Goldman Sachs or another, another organization, sure, you're, you're trading back and forth with them, but if that institution gets into trouble, if Goldman gets into trouble, the clearinghouse acts as the guarantor and will pay the contract off. And so that's a dramatic change in, in the uncertain, in the contractual uncertainty and about the kind of information that you need in order to evaluate uh, the credit worthiness of, of your counterparty or just your willingness to engage in, in the market. One of the things that we saw during this, uh, this time period is that people would report their, their risk exposures and how well they had, uh, had hedged things. But many of the hedging instruments were not um, things on exchanges or things that were cleared on clearinghouses, but were so-called over-the-counter. Those were just bilateral contracts between two, uh, two organizations. And the way these contracts were structured, uh, you actually could, could move your obligation to someone else, sell to someone else, without telling the person on the other side. Eventually you had to tell them, but you didn't have to, you didn't have to get their permission in advance. So we come into this, uh, this incredibly challenging time in the fall of 2008. A lot of hedging has gone on through this over-the-counter market, through this uh, much more informal market. And there's nothing wrong with having, having informal markets, but the infrastructure wasn't there. Because then you would suddenly ask, well, you know, what is your risk exposure to Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Lehman Brothers, the others? Some organizations simply didn't know because the contracts had been moved along and they, or, they hadn't organized things like that. They knew what their risk exposure was to um, the, uh, the corporate sector or to gold or to, um, uh, to parts of the housing market, 
Well, actually, many of them didn't know that, unfortunately. But in principle, they, uh, they, they should have been able to answer that question. But they couldn't tell you exactly what their risk exposure was to individual institutions. But even if you knew your risk exposure to, to Goldman Sachs, you needed to know whether Goldman Sachs was exposed to Lehman Brothers or to AIG or to something else, because their health depended upon the counterparties they were trading with. And then you had to know the counterparties' counterparties, and the counterparties' counterparties' counterparty. And, and this is one of the things that really came in in that, uh, that week after uh, uh, Lehman's, uh, Lehman's demise. Lehman actually did not uh, trigger a particular problem in the so-called over-the-counter derivatives market, but it was on, uh, so Lehman failed on Sunday night, mon Monday morning. Um, Monday was actually uh, not a good day in the markets, but not a chaotic day. Tuesday was the chaotic day, because that was the day when uh, that uh, money market mutual fund broke the buck. But also, that's the day we intervened with American, uh, American International Group, AIG, because AIG was heavily involved in this over-the-counter derivative market. It was writing insurance contracts um, and taking one side of the market. So everyone was buying insurance from, from AIG against the possibility of default of um, IBM, against the possibility of default of General Motors, against the possibility of default of, uh, on mortgages. So they were all taking one side of the market, but because this was just a, um, uh, this, this bilateral market, uh, nothing was, there was no centralized information. No one knew, or at least the supervisors didn't know, and many market participants didn't know, that they were basically on the side, other side of every contract. And if they had gone down, that would have meant that virtually every major institution was quite exposed, that well-hedged positions suddenly were unhedged, and no one was going to take that risk exposure at that time. And so um, there would have been no one to, uh, to, to substitute into those contracts. So suddenly what seemed to be well-hedged positions would have been completely unhedged, and that would have been chaotic for the, uh, for the markets. Well, if you have a centrally cleared platform, if you have things that are traded on exchanges or at the very least cleared through a centralized marketplace, with the, the clearinghouse as the guarantor, that acts as, uh, as, as a, very important, um, um, uh, a very important barrier to the ripple effects of one institution going down and then having ripple effects across the economy. It stops with the clearinghouse. So as long as the clearinghouse is, uh, is seen as, uh, as sound and solid, uh, it, can, it can prevent these sort of, uh, these sort of um, ripple effects in the, uh, uh, in the markets, these sort of problems with, that come from the, the interconnections. Now, that may seem like, well, this is, uh, uh, this is the magic bullet. We just have everything centrally cleared, and then we don't have to worry about the interconnectedness problem. We don't have to worry about the legal uncertainty problem. All, uh, we don't have to have all that other information. Uh, not quite so fast. Uh, I, think these are, I think it's valuable to try to give very strong incentives to get more things onto these kind of platforms so we don't get the same kinds of uh, risk concentrations that, uh, that arose uh, without, markets, uh, without markets knowing. Uh, and, but if you put everything into these institutions and they haven't been dealing with these kinds of contracts before, you better make sure that their incentives are right and their risk management is uh, unexceptional, you know, just perfect, uh, because you've now made everyone interconnected into these institutions. And so that's one of the things that Don Frank is doing, is trying to give incentives to get things to be centrally cleared, which, which I applaud, and it's trying to come up with a new regulatory framework for these kinds, of, uh, these kinds of organizations to try to get the incentives right, to try to get the capital right, to try to make sure that they are, uh, that they are stable and sturdy under, uh, under stress. The problem is a lot of stress has been put on uh, the SEC and uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, the other major regulator in this, uh, in this area, to come up with rules for the next thousand years uh, to make sure that these things are, are bulletproof and do that just like that. To, get, to make sure that you've got this right, uh, when you're getting so many new contracts on there, it's going to take some time. And, uh, and uh, to the extent there are timetables, and there are a lot of timetables in uh, Dodd-Frank, the regulators are missing most of these. But I actually think that's a good thing that they're missing them, because I'd much rather get this right than just get it done. And, and unfortunately, I think there's a lot of just get it done type of mentality in, uh, uh, in some of, um, uh, of Dodd-Frank just so to get these things completed. We've got to get these things right. And so it's another incomplete, a very, very important, uh, very, very important issue. Uh, one more benefit that I wanted to, to, to mention about, uh, about clearinghouses is since the clearinghouse is on the hook if something goes wrong, they have an awful lot of incentive to make sure that an institution like AIG can't take the kind of bets that it did. 
because it just kept betting on one side of the market. It kept getting payments for this insurance, but incredibly, it wasn't having to, to uh, hold any capital against those bets. And, uh, and that's because people didn't know it was taking all these bets, and you don't have to do that in the, uh, in the, uh, in the bilateral, or in, at least in this particular bilateral market. On a, on a centrally cleared platform, the clearinghouse is going to say, hey, since we're on the hook, we're going to monitor your risk concentration. You're going to have to report to us on a regular basis how much risk you're taking. And we're pr we may put some risk limits on there. And also, if we see the market get really frothy and, uh, and start to move very, uh, uh, very rapidly, we may ask for more capital from you and from everybody else who's in that market. And we've just seen that now uh, in, the, uh, in the silver market on the, the, uh, the uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange. The silver prices started zooming up really rapidly. And effectively, we had some, uh, some very good private regulation come in and say, well, we're not so sure that this makes sense. We don't know what's, what's really driving it. We're worried about greater volatility in the market. And when there's greater volatility, what we need is greater protection. We need more, uh, more collateral that's put up in case, something, in, some, in case something goes wrong and in case one of our, uh, the players gets, gets into trouble. That slowed a little bit of the frothiness of the markets without destroying the markets. And, uh, and of course, they got the incentives right. If you don't have uh, the, uh, the private clearinghouse system, you either don't have anyone monitoring it, or what you have is the regulators looking over it, and then it becomes a political issue. Because there, are, and, and this came up so much in, uh, in, the, in the housing market. Uh, we, had put, we had put out proposed guidelines, not even formal regula regulatory limits, but guidelines on commercial real estate concentration for uh, commercial banks. If you had more than 300% of your common equity in this one basket. So you put all those eggs in one basket in commercial real estate. You had to sit down and talk with your supervisor about your risk management, about why you're doing it, and to make sure that you were managing this properly. We didn't say you couldn't go beyond 300%, but we said you had to, uh, to uh, talk with the supervisor. And where we got that from was some good systematic data analysis, looking at the savings and loan crisis, looking in, uh, in other areas and seeing that uh, uh, or in, in other, other experiences that when you get so much concentration in commercial real estate, you can be much more likely to, to get into trouble, get a downgrade, or even, even go uh, 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 get towards, uh, towards failure. And so we had some good empirical basis for this. Firestorm of protest against that. Are you trying to kill the commercial real estate industry? Are you trying to kill uh, middle market banks? Because a lot of middle market banks and smaller banks, primarily what they do is, is, uh, is this kind of lending. And so you're prejudiced against us, you're trying to kill us, and you're trying to, to, to kill this market, and if you put this through, you're gonna kill that market, it's gonna be your fault. And it took us a long time. We eventually did get this, this through, but we had to do two rounds of comments, and because uh, whenever you do regulatory, regulatory changes, you have to have comments in, assess those comments. So it took a very long time. Now I think there were many people who were very happy that we eventually did do that, uh, because they, uh, they, they slowed down their, their concentrations. Um, you see the, the political problem and also the slowness with which supervisors, even if they're aware of a problem, can act only after sort of a notice and comment period, which is appropriate for a, uh, a, 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 a democracy that you have that kind of open, transparent debate. But that's why something like a, a private clearinghouse is much better positioned to do it. They do it. And people can complain that they shouldn't have done it. Well, that's fine. They can go to another exchange if they don't, don't like the, the way that the Chicago Mercantile Exchange operates. Um, and so, so I think that's, that's something that's very, very valuable to try to, as much as possible, use uh, these, um, uh, the, the right incentives that the private sector has, and also to avoid uh, a lot of the politics that comes in uh, with the, uh, with, uh, the uh, uh, when, uh, when, even when the regulators are trying to do the right thing, it can be very, very difficult to, to actually implement that. One last piece that uh, I want to close with is something that, uh, that Dodd-Frank did that I think was, uh, was not in the right direction and I think really um, uh, shows that th there wasn't a good analysis of the, the sources of the, of the problems. And this is the so-called Volcker Rule. Uh, so what the Volcker Rule does is it tries to take out some of the, um, uh, the activities that banks have and put them elsewhere. So a commercial bank now no longer can be involved with a hedge fund. It can't be involved with, uh, uh, with private equity. And most importantly, it can't be involved with proprietary trading. Now the problem is, it's not very clear what proprietary trading is. I was on a panel with Paul Volcker um, about a year before this, uh, uh, the Volcker Rule was enunciated as the Volcker Rule. Paul had been talking about this for, for a while, but uh, it, it was only when President Obama said that he wanted to put this in the legislation that became the Volcker Rule. And so I, I pressed Paul on this and said, well, you know, exactly what do you mean by proprietary trading? 
and he basically gave me the answer that you often hear in pornography. You know it when you see it. And, uh, and you know, I felt, while well, I was sitting on the Supervision Regulation Committee, I certainly didn't have as much experience as, uh, as Paul Volcker had had, but I didn't feel that I could make those, those kinds of distinctions. And uh, the, the regulators are struggling with this right now, trying to decide what is appropriate or inappropriate trading. So some things are very natural for hedging, for, and banks and financial institutions, of course, should be doing some hedging of their, uh, their risks. But when does the hedging get into to speculation? Because often you can't hedge something directly. So you don't have a perfect hedge. You do something that's correlated with the thing that's, that's of interest. So it's, it's close, but it's not a perfect, perfect hedge. Well, so there's a speculative um, piece of that. Well, how far can you go before the regulators draw the line and say you can't do that? It's very, very difficult to do that. And also, wherever the regulators draw the line, there's going to be an incentive to get just on the other side of that line. Uh, I saw this over and over again, this so-called uh, so boundary problem. Uh, and because uh, we get lots of complaints that uh, we, uh, you know, we were too prescriptive in our, our regulations, so I wanted general guidelines. But whenever we gave general guidelines rather than the clear, bright line, they get very upset because they said, well, how do we know how to get around it? Uh, they wouldn't say that explicitly, but they would kind of <laughs> effectively. Uh, uh, it was clear that that's what they were, that what their general counsels were, were saying to us. A and, um, you know, and that's, and that's a, a very, very important issue. It's a very delicate issue. And, uh, and I worry that this may just push more activities into the shadows. So an unintended consequence of this, instead of making the system more stable, could potentially make it less stable. And, and also, if you look at the sources of the problems of the crisis, it wasn't proprietary trading, and it certainly wasn't hedge funds or uh, private equity investments by commercial banks that got firms into trouble. It was good old-fashioned mortgage lending where they were just taking far too many risks. The big institutions that went down Washington Mutual, IndyMac, and Wachovia, which had bought Golden West, a very large, uh, had been a large thrift organization. It was not anything exotic that they were doing on pr the trading side or uh, exposure to head funds or, or private equity. It was just they were taking far too many risks in, uh, in their core business. And, that's, and I worry a little bit about this. Um, by focusing on this, somehow people think that they've solved some problem that they haven't and also that they may have caused a problem that they didn't intend to cause by just pushing more things off into the shadows, more things where it's difficult for the regulators to see the interconnections, where it's more difficult to see some of the, uh, uh, the issues and, uh, and challenges that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that are associated with them. Um, the, uh, now there's a, a formal, uh, 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 the, uh, the FSOC, the uh, Financial Stability Oversight Council of all the regulators getting together, a body of, uh, I think, about 12 different, uh, different regulators to get together to see where all the risks are. Um, good luck in trying to see everything, uh, but also it's difficult to coordinate across those, those regulators. Uh, and, uh, and, so, and it's just difficult to know where everything potentially can go wrong. And, uh, and so I worry that people are be a little bit too self-satisfied with, well, we've, we've done that. We've taken out um, these types of activities from banks, so now they're safe. Uh, we've gotten things onto uh, centrally cleared platforms, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, we now have a resolution mechanism, so we don't have to worry about that. I think that's, it's dangerous if we, we come, become too complacent. I think there are a lot of things in, uh, in Dodd-Frank where it's a good beginning of the discussion, uh, but I said it's a very incomplete, uh, it's, it's, it's very incomplete, and it's gonna take years to implement these, and most importantly, it's going to take a while to, uh, to get them right. So hopefully uh, you will not conclude, uh, as many of my former students and, and friends in the markets had, that now former Governor Krosner has said nothing. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>